tutti i partecipanti sono in grado solo di ascoltare. Ok, welcome to the seventh uh, webinar of the ICCG uh, Water Webinar Series on managing water scarcity and economics perspective from California. And it will be delivered by uh, Frank Convery and Matthew Saragosa Watkins from the Environment Defense Fund. And uh, so now we'll briefly present you the speakers of today. Uh, Frank Convery is a chief economist at EDF since uh, 2014, uh, where he has focused on climate and energy issues, such as emission trading markets and abatements, regulation of natural gas supply, electricity pricing and time of use consumption in ways to improve economic efficiency, oceans and ecosystems. He coordinated the research networks uh, in the EU on the use of market-based instruments for environmental policy and on emission trading. As professor of environmental policy at University College Dublin, he has led research into the design and implementation of market-based instruments in Ireland. He is honorary president of the European Association of Resource Economists, and he was elected as European Fiscal Reformer of the year 2013. And Matthew Saragosa Watkins also joined the EDF in uh, 2014, and he is a senior economist in the EDF Office of Economic Policy and Analysis, where he works on transportation econ economics, environmental regulation of power plants under the Clean Air Act, and water markets in the Western US. His research is at the intersection of public finance with environmental energy and natural resource economics, economics, with an emphasis on designing property rights schemes, efficient markets, and policies to curb environmental externalities and efficiently and equitably allocate natural resources. Themes in his research are optimal policy design for multiple unpriced externalities, and agent responses to environmental policy. So now I leave the floor to Professor uh, Convery for, um, to deliver his, uh, the webinar, the first part. It will be split in three different sections. So uh, the floor is yours. Thanks. With you all. And uh, as uh, Isabella pointed out, we're going to focus on California and its water management issues. And that's because we're working on it, but also because it's a very, very dynamic economy, one of the most innovative and rapidly growing in the world. And it has a huge water policy scarcity challenge. So we think it's very, very uh, interesting case study to look at. We do also, however, touch on experience in Australia and in uh, Israel. Uh, our presentation is in three modules. Uh, I'll start with a kind of a general overview about how economists evaluate policy performance. Then Matthew will take over looking at the specifics of California and then we'll conclude together uh, on looking ahead from, with experience from around the world. Uh, I think our presentation is very complementary to a previous one. That, by the way, should be 2015, not 2005, uh, which uh, Pasquale Steduto focused on the Near East and North Africa. Uh, technical solutions were very elegantly identified in that presentation. Uh, ours complements it in the sense that we say, okay, that's what should happen. How can we make it happen? And that's where economic thinking generally, at prices specifically, can be extremely important in going from what should to what can and what must. Uh, in our slides, we do give references at the back. We won't uh, touch on them, but for those of you who want to know more, uh, we've listed them by uh, case country, by California, Australia, and uh, Israel. Turning now to the first module, how economists evaluate policy performance. Uh, the most famous quotation probably in economics is on the screen now from Adam Smith. 
And it's very, very famous because it gets a central message across, which still is the essence, really, of how we manage microeconomies. And that is that incentives matter, self-interest matters, and if you want things to happen, it needs to be the self-interest of people, what he calls self-love, in order to get people to act uh, coherently. And for environment and resources, this insight is absolutely crucial. Prices, of course, are the most important incentive for most of us most of the time. And well-functioning markets are a key part of that. There are three reasons why prices are critical. First of all, they tell us what when things are scarce. Uh, high prices obviously mean things are scarcer than low prices. Uh, secondly, prices support innovation. If there's a high price for something, it encourages people to find new and better ways of uh, supplying the good or service in question. And thirdly, and critically important in many cases, is that a well-functioning market clears the market. You can always buy the good or service at the price. So there's no queuing, there's no rationing. The market clears is the way that we express that idea. The second dimension that is critical, of course, to effective prices and, and markets is property rights, because you can't sell what you don't own. And if you don't uh, have property rights, essentially a market either doesn't exist at all or it's very, very imperfect. A second dimension which can be critically important for entrepreneurs is that if you don't have a property right, it's very often difficult to borrow money from a lender because a lender looks for collateral for something that they can get if you fail to pay your debt. And if you don't have property rights, you don't uh, have Professor collateral. Congress, sorry, we don't hear you yes? well now. I think the volume... Okay. Okay, I'll speak a little louder. Sorry about that. Uh, we can't hear you still. Okay. We'll pause here and increase the volume. Okay. Just the last slide. Okay. Okay, how about that? No, no. It seems like very, very low. Sorry about that. We are trying to fix it. Okay. 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 Is that better? And uh, no, it's really low. Okay. Now. Okay. Now. Okay. Trying again. It's a bit better, but better, you should but speak very loud. Okay. Okay. How about okay, that? You can go. You can go on. Maybe speak a bit louder. Okay, I'll speak louder. You can take the last uh, slide. Market failure. Okay. Thank you. Thank okay, you. I'll go back to, yes, uh, property rights are critical for effective markets to work because you can't sell what you don't uh, own and it's very difficult to borrow money if you don't have property rights because lenders will not uh, lend to you. Uh, so prices and property rights are two sides of the same coin. Uh, a third dimension that economists look at carefully is market failure, and then specifically we look at costs that are not carried by the person who imposes them. So when you pollute the air or the water, you pass the costs of that on to somebody else. The polluter does not pay, and those costs are called external costs, and it means there's no price out there that tells you you're causing damage, imposing costs, and therefore there's no feedback on the scarcity of the resource or on uh, support for innovation. 
And the result is that we see all over the world is that environmental assets are destroyed. Uh, these uh, inefficient markets, property right failure, market failure, and so on, impose very, very large costs on a society. Uh, they reduce economic activity, they waste resources, they discourage innovation, and of course they incur environmental losses. So correcting for all of these problems is crucially important. Now I'm handing over to uh, Matthew, who's going to look at the specifics of California. Over. Thank you, Frank. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for having me today. Let me just start the slideshow here. Huh. Oh. Sorry about that. There we go. So I'll be talking to you a little bit about uh, evaluating water policy in California. And unfortunately, uh, much of the data necessary to formally evaluate what's going on in California uh, is unavailable. So instead of formally analyzing California, what we're going to do is look at some suggestive statistics and evidence uh, of inefficiency. And just as a preview of the results, we're going to find a lot of it. So there are 40 million Californians. Um, many of them live in urban areas, uh, the vast majority of them, where they use water primarily for uh, essential functions, you know, taking showers, drinking, uh, flushing the toilets. But in California, we see that more than 80% of the water that is used for human life uh, is allocated to agriculture. Well, that might be surprising uh, and might seem like evidence that uh, there's inefficiencies in the allocation of water, that might not necessarily be true, right? If the vast majority of water is used for agriculture, but the value of producing those goods is very high, uh, then we would expect to see most of it allocated to agriculture. In practice, agriculture produces about $50 billion worth of value, um, which is about 2.5% of the California economy. So uh, not a great start there. Another thing that we can look at are prices in the, uh, in the economy. If the price of water in agriculture is the same as the price of water in cities, then the last drop of water used for agriculture and the last drop of water used for cities will have the same value. Um, and so in that sense, we can think that there's efficiency between sectors. Uh, unfortunately, as an example, let's look at growers who receive water in the imperial County of California, that's in the southeast, they pay $25 per thousand cubic meters, uh, whereas residents of uh, Monterey, California, a small city on the coast, can pay as much as $25,000 uh, per cubic meter, per thousand cubic meters. Obviously, that's a thousand times more than what uh, growers in, in Imperial are paying, and so it's probably the case that that's distorting how water is used between those two groups. Of course, maybe it's the case that uh, water use within each sector uh, is efficiently allocated, even if water prices across sectors aren't. Um, and so now here we're going to look to crop choices. As it turns out, uh, well, those Imperial County uh, water users get water for $25 per thousand cubic meters. In the Central Valley of California, farmers can pay as much as $2,500 uh, per thousand cubic meters. So again, that's 100 times more than what's being paid by some. And we see that bear out in crop choice. Uh, in places where farmers are paying a lot for water now, uh, they're producing relatively higher value crops than in places where farmers don't face the true opportunity cost of water and therefore don't have the same competitive pressures to move towards uh, higher value crops. Now, one question that you might naturally ask is that, uh, well, if almonds can produce five times as much value with the same acreage, 
why isn't everybody in California producing almonds? Uh, and to some degree they are. Uh, just last year, 12 and a half million new almond trees were planted in California, much of that on land that was previously producing alfalfa or rice or other crops. Uh, one concern with the introduction of almonds is that once an almond tree is planted, you can't fallow that land. Uh, so it's firm demand, and if it doesn't receive water, then the plant dies. So we're seeing demand for water in the agricultural sector become relatively less elastic in California. Switching slides. Groundwater has even less data, uh, so we're going to rely on principles uh, rather than facts to think about what the efficiency of the groundwater market is. Essentially, the market is open access, where anyone who owns land can drill a well uh, and extract as much water as they, they want or can get their hands on. The problem with this approach is essentially described best by Daniel Day-Lewis in the movie There Will Be Blood, uh, where he is an oil man who's buying up land around Bakersfield, a town in the Central Valley of California, around the turn of the 20th century. And he stares to another farmer whose land he's looking to buy, and he says, you don't have to sell me your land, but I drink your milkshake. And for those of you who don't know what a milkshake is, I've got a picture of it right here, and conveniently it has two straws in it. Groundwater, just like milkshakes sometimes, are a common pool resource, as Eleanor Ostrom describes it. What that means in practice is that when one person or one farmer takes water out of the ground, uh, their extraction affects another neighbor's ability to extract water. Um, as you extract water, the water table falls, and it becomes more costly to take water out, but also, if the wells are of different depth, then those with the shallowest wells are the ones to lose out to the access to water first. Essentially, those with the deepest straws, or wells, ultimately win and have the most access to water rights, which raises, of course, questions of equity, but also potentially questions of efficiency, as those with less deep wells might have had higher values for water. Next, we turn to externalities associated with uh, the way water is used in California. The map here to the left shows uh, California, and then in red are the places uh, where water is used primarily for fish habitat, uh, and in particular, freshwater salmon, uh, which are a relatively high value product. Uh, as you can see, much of the north and east of California provides habitat for this relatively high value product, but as demand for water has grown in California, rather than applying appropriate pricing, predominantly what we've done is uh, drain and divert and dam uh, these places where water is available, often destroying or significantly affecting habitat for those native species. In groundwater, we have what Garrett uh, Hardin described as a tragedy of the commons. Essentially, as I described before, one's extraction affects their neighbor's ability to access. Uh, also, over time, as the resource is extracted, it's ultimately exhausted for future generations, so they don't have access to it. And then finally, uh, there's something called subsidence, which is the natural lowering of the ground level as the water in the ground supporting it uh, is drained. That destroys the natural aquifer capital that's available and ultimately may not be able to recharge as much groundwater as, as taken out. Even without externalities, we're still from an efficient market. Um, in general, the prices for water are wrong uh, because there are barriers to transacting it and there are incomplete property rights, which is to say those who are allowed to use water aren't necessarily allowed to trade it. In the market sense, uh, we have the wrong prices. Remember when I said that those in Imperial got water for $25 per thousand cubic meters, while some in uh, Monterey had to pay $25,000? That wrong price leads to misallocation. On the innovation front, when those farmers in Imperial face $25 per thousand cubic meters, and uh, they're not incented to invest in the sort of efficient technology that um, would allow them to produce more 
uh, with less. They see the wrong market signal, and so the overall production possibilities of the economy are less than what they otherwise should be. In the governance sense, those incomplete property rights, which are a function of how we uh, design rules for who can use water and how much, also lead to barriers to transacting. Um, those barriers to transacting create walls where prices in one area can't equilibrate with prices in another. As I described before, that leads to misallocation in the case of surface water, and in the case of groundwater, it leads to over-extraction. Also in governance, barriers to transacting surface water, like I said, lead to the wrong prices and ultimately misallocation. Richard Howitt at UC Davis uh, and his colleagues have estimated that the misallocation just in the Central Valley of California alone and just for surface water costs California in excess of $1 billion a year. Expanding that across all of California and including groundwater, it's easy to imagine that the total external costs of these market failures exceed two and maybe as high as $5 billion annually. Fortunately, it's not all bad news. Uh, California is working on improving uh, its ability to manage both surface and groundwater uh, with innovative new rules and strategies. Uh, and we also have great examples from around the world that can help us design our better institutions. The Association of California Water Agencies, an organization and group of org agencies that the Environmental Defense Fund is working with in represents nearly all of the water uh, used both in agricultural purposes and by residents. Uh, now we're working with them to reform the rules governing surface water trade. Freer trade uh, means less price disparity, and less price disparity means greater efficiency and greater investment in innovation. We're involved in reforming surface water markets because while markets are great at uh, providing efficient allocations, they don't necessarily come with a moral compass or a conscience. It's important that when designing markets, we provide protections for third parties, uh, those who might work in agriculture and be affected by changing prices of water, uh, and also environmental externalities associated with redirecting water for new purposes in different places. And, and finally, as I said, there's almost a billion dollars alone in the Central Valley that is going to be created by improving the efficiency of surface water markets. It's important that in creating that value, the distribution of it is equitable, and that's where we come in. The image to the left shows a man standing next to a pole that's marked the ground level in the Central Valley between 1925 and 1977. You can see up there at the top that that was the ground level in 25, and over the course of that 52 years, the total ground level in California dropped by nine meters, uh, and it's continued to drop since 1977. That's because of excessive groundwater pumping leading to an overall subsidence. In 2014, California recognizing that in some places they were right about to run out of groundwater entirely, they've implemented the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. That requires critically overdrafted basins to develop sustainable groundwater management plans by 2020, uh, essentially finding a way to achieve a maximum cap on total allowable water extracted. EDF is working with pilot basins to develop models for managing groundwater that don't just set a cap without assigning property rights, but also allow trade so that those with the greatest value for water are able to access it efficiently and equitably. Australia provides an example for where California could be in the future. The image to the right shows the Murray-Darling Basin in green. Uh, Murray and Darling are rivers um, around which much of the agriculture in Australia is uh, located. In the 1970s, the Murray-Darling River Basin was chronically overdrafted. Uh, the rivers ran dry on several occasions, and the allocation of water uh, was inefficient, often leading to cities running out. 
government reforms between the 80s and 2000s uh, made significant improvements. In the 80s, uh, the Murray-Darling River Basin Authority set an aggregate cap uh, determining how much water could in total be extracted from the area. In the 1990s, the Murray-Darling Basin unbundled the right to use and sell water from the property. Prior to that, and as it is in California, you were allowed to use whatever water you wanted uh, or had rights to, so long as you used it on the land uh, that that water had been originally allocated to. By allowing trade in water, uh, now places where water is most productive can also be the places where water is most available. Finally, in the 2000s, uh, the Murray-Darling River Basin introduced a trading platform, substantially reducing the costs of negotiating and transacting in the water market. So far, the outcomes have been fantastic. Uh, while the total amount of water extracted from the Murray-Darling Basin by humans uh, declined, the total of value of water has grown. Sellers with property rights to that water who traded away were made whole, reducing their agricultural output, but capturing the value embodied in the water that they had. Agriculture has become more productive, and with more efficient prices, Technology has been deployed uh, where growers understand that by using more efficient technology, they can free up water to sell into the market and capture the value associated with it. Perhaps the market was the biggest innovation uh, that Australia was able to introduce. The figure to the left shows trading of water by volume between 2000 and 2011. You can see that in 2007, the year that the trading platform was introduced, regulated and unregulated trades of surface water increased dramatically and continued to increase through 2009. In 2009, you see the introduction of that green area. That's Australian government purchases. The introduction of the market and an understanding of where water could be purchased from uh, and what the opportunity cost of purchasing it was allowed the Australian government to introduce a concept of an environmental steward. And here the idea is that the environmental steward who manages water flows can purchase water allocations uh, for environmental purposes when the natural flows in the river are low, manage the allocations to sustain healthy rivers and provide water for economic prosperity, and in times of plenty, sell water to farmers and use those revenues to invest in efficiency projects like lots, uh, that reduces the amount of water lost in the system. Then the steward can use that conserved water to purchase environmental flows. Again, essentially creating a virtuous cycle of investment and development that provides for environmental protection while also creating economic prosperity. Now we'll turn it back over to Frank to talk about Australia, uh, Israel. Matthew, uh, Israel is famous for many things, but one is its innovation and business development in uh, water. And uh, it gets to this innovation point that both Matthew and I have kept emphasizing. And uh, in Israel, they have something they call the New Tech Program that promotes Israel as a global leader, basically. And to do that, and I think it is interesting to know what it takes to succeed in that regard, you have to invest in people, what economists call human capital, you have to invest in research and development, in marketing, you have to support startup companies, and that means, of course, being open to new entrants, and you have to be international in scope. And by embracing that kind of set of ideas, uh, they've had great uh, success, both in terms of local development and global export of uh, innovative water technologies. And as uh, in the case of Australia, um, Austra um, Israel has managed to dramatically increase its uh, agricultural performance and output while reducing the use of its uh, water. And it is the highest ratio of crop yield per cubic meter of water in the world. So that tells you really that the water in Israel in, within agriculture is going to those 
activities that produce the greatest net uh, output. Uh, next slide, please. However, uh, a key point we've been making is that prices are key in stimulating uh, innovation. And uh, one of the features that one sees in uh, Israel is increasing block tariffs. And the idea there, of course, is that as you use more water per unit time, the price of that water at the margin increases. And that naturally encourages you to be careful and parsimonious and to avoid going into the very, very expensive blocks of, uh, of uh, water. And that model applies both in agriculture and in uh, urban areas. So it's both household industry and farmers. And the outcome of getting the prices right together with the institutional investments and arrangements that I mentioned earlier, give you this kind of virtuous uh, circle. And uh, they produced a number and a range of technologies with uh, huge export markets, including water meters that are read remotely, and so on. Uh, so it's, I think it's an important case where the pieces of the jigsaw were gradually put in place. As economists, the first one we look at it are, is price, but there are also many other elements that have to be uh, organized. Next slide, please. Thank you. That brings us to the end of our presentation. So we're handing back now to Isabella to manage the Q&A. Thank you very much uh, for um, your presentation. Um, yes, um, we have a few questions from the audience. So um, this is related to California, so maybe I will address to Matthew. Um, the question is, um, how do you think the example of California can be a model for a Western region of, of North America, which are experiencing loss of precipitation and snow melt? in Rockies that otherwise sustain aquifers and watersheds? Matthew, can you answer the question? There we go. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a good question. California is certainly an innovative place, and unfortunately, for water, it's a little bit behind the times. Um, but there are other states in the West that are also working to innovate. Uh, in particular, Nevada uh, and Colorado, uh, where EDF is working with uh, what they call the local water master um, to design sustainable management plans for groundwater. Um, I think. The biggest place where there are interactions between California and the rest of the West is in the context of the Colorado River uh, Basin, which flows through seven states um, and is one of our largest sources of hydropower uh, and water delivery throughout the West. There, uh, the Colorado River Basin has been historically overdrafted because the allocation of water that was made available to states uh, exceeds what the actual flows on the river are. Uh, one place where we're working, um, and I think where California can be an example, uh, is in the Imperial Irrigation District. We're working with farmers to try and find ways to uh, manage scarcer water uh, and then free up some of uh, the water that's saved through pricing mechanisms uh, upstream um, and to other urban users. I think in that way, California and the rest of the Western states can cooperate on a, a unified framework for what they call for the Colorado River, the law of the river. Thank you very much, Matthew. Um, I have another question uh, that I would like to, to ask you on California, so that we stay in California now. So how will climate change affect water availability in California, and what, what can markets do to address climate change impacts? Absolutely fantastic question. So. As you mentioned in the last question, uh, the Rockies are losing 
uh, snowpack. That's true of the Sierra Nevada, the primary mountain range in California as well. Um, as our climate changes and as our population grows, there's going to be a substantial mismatch between where water is available and how much is available uh, and how much is demanded. Under our current system that doesn't manage water especially well through prices, we're going to see increasing pressure uh, between users that have water and from those that don't. In terms of adaptation, uh, which is ultimately one of the things we need to do in response to climate change, as well as, of course, mitigation, uh, markets are our first line of defense, right? As resources become more scarce, if we have markets, prices will reflect that scarcity and consumers uh, and suppliers can respond both by reallocating and by providing efficient solutions to improve the efficiency and value with which water is used and allocated. Thank you very much for this extensive um, answer. Um, I have a question for um, Professor Conway now. Um, um, as you say, markets are good at Can you hear? Yeah. Uh, as you say, markets are good at allocating resources, but uh, how do you make sure that the outcomes are fair and without any consequences for the environment? Yeah, that also is a terrific uh, question. And uh, it gets up a key issue because once you assign property rights, of course, you're giving a valuable asset to somebody. And as economists, we say that's absolutely critical because uh, otherwise you can't trade, you can't borrow, you can't innovate, and so on. But uh, there's also this huge fairness uh, issue. So it is critically important that, uh, and this applies whenever you're allocating a fishery or the right to pollute or whatever, um, that you have a system in place that really does uh, interrogate the fairness as well as the efficiency of who gets the property rights. Uh, because if you don't do that, uh, first of all, uh, you get a pushback, obviously, on the politics of it, but also you can, in some cases, create monopoly power. So if you gave the water rights to one or two people or companies, of course, you would then reintroduce uh, inefficiency. So that really is a critical point, and it's why uh, the property allocation piece of the policy system typically takes a long time. It often involves courts. Uh, governments can be extremely useful and are essential, in fact, in managing that process fairly. In practice, in virtually every situation, the people who are actually there and using the resource uh, tend to be the people who get the property rights. So that's a kind of a starting position. But it's a very, very good point, and it's one that needs to be very seriously addressed, or the system either would be done poorly, or it will get stopped by the politics of it. Thank you very much. Um, I have a, I have another question to you um, because it uh, concerns Israel. So the question is, with respect to Israel and water and food security issues, how can you see the transferability of Israel learnings to the water scarce regions of the Mediterranean region and Northern Africa? So water there is very important for food production. So how can you see this transferability there? Well, I, they, they have done two things in Israel. First of all, I mean, the first decision for a Mediterranean country to take is to say, let's take this business really seriously and see what it takes to uh, both manage the resource within the country uh, efficiently, but also to create an export uh, business. So uh, the prerequisites, the kind of investments that you have to make in people, in research and development, in institutional development, in legal frameworks, in property rights, 
all of that is absolutely essential. And if you don't do that, then basically you're not going to succeed. And it takes time and effort and constant uh, evolution. Uh, Matthew showed the story of uh, Australia, where basically you're looking at a 15 to 20 year policy evolution. Um, and in his case, and in the Australia case, going back to the previous question, the government in, can intervene in a market once it exists to buy re-assets, environment, or rather water in this case, to use to protect the environment or to protect public interest recreation and so on. Um, and the second dimension, of course, is uh, getting prices to work for you. And uh, again, going back to the previous question, uh, making sure that the allocation of property rights is fair and seen to be fair so that there's an independent board that does the allocation. There's a way of appealing those decisions so you can get a proper hearing as the process uh, unfolds. Um, so I think it is really, really important for countries to take this on, take a long view, learn what they can from what other jurisdictions are doing learn from the mistakes of California, and uh, learn from the successes of other places, and just keep at it. Persistence is critical. Thank you very much. Um, we have a few questions on California, so I will address them to Matthew then. Um, the first of them is, um, do you think that pumping underground water is the main factor of looming desertification of most of California area? Sorry, could you repeat that? Just the end there? Sure. Um, do you think that pumping underground water is the main factor of looming desertification of most of California area? Ah, uh, yeah, almost certainly that's the case, um, that massive pumping of underground water, uh, really after the Dust Bowl in, Cal uh, in the western United States, so beginning in the mid-30s and going through, um, right through the 1980s uh, and even to today, has had major impact. Okay, thank you. And related to this the another question is, uh, can the salinized uh, water quantity replace most of the underground water pumping? Well, water desalinization is very expensive, um, or at least relatively expensive to conservation and, and reallocation. So while in some places, um, because diverting water to those places like San Diego, California, for example, um, is relatively expensive and, and therefore desalinization may make sense because of its you know, obvious tremendous access to saline water. Um, probably desalinization is not a long-term sustainable solution or a cost-effective one for California at large. Okay, thank you. And uh, I have a question for you. Um, why don't farmers with water rights plant only almonds or other high-value crops instead of alfalfa or cotton? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, right? You would think that with almond prices at record highs um, and sort of no end to demand in sight, that everybody in California would be planting almonds as a way to monetize the value in water if they're not allowed to trade it, as I described before. I think in practice that's happening, but it takes time. Um, as farmers learn about the opportunities, and of course there are farmers out there who've never grown almonds before. Um, but like I said, we saw 12 and a half million trees planted in California last year alone. Uh, the problem with that is of course that once you plant an almond tree, you always have to give it water or it dies. Uh, unlike other crops where you can cultivate them in one year and then fallow the land in future years if there's drought. That hardening of demand uh, or making demand less responsive to changing price uh, sort of locks in how water is used in California um, and probably makes it more difficult to improve the efficiency of the market as those with access to water today 
see the opportunity cost of freeing up that water for other purposes uh, go up. Ultimately, seeing these almonds planted is maybe not a great story for California. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a comment, more than a question, but I'd like to read because it's interesting. Um, it says, perhaps the best from the economic game can be achieved by respecting the biophysical limits imposed by California's natural processes. Uh, local scale of biophysical limits of nature. Um, what do you think, Matt, about this comment? Frank, do you want to take that one? Yes, well, if we just go back to Matthew's point about the desalinization, the other point about it, in addition to the expense of it, is that it tends to use a lot of energy. So it can be very carbon intensive. So it can compound the problem of greenhouse gas emissions and uh, climate change. And for the Mediterranean, the poor Mediterranean countries, uh, of course, the expense is absolutely critical. Uh, if you're a very poor country, moving into desalinization is almost certainly a very, very inefficient way to manage your uh, resource. Um, in terms of the uh, limits, uh, of course, the essence of the uh, kind of cap and trade model and the creation of markets is that uh, those uh, caps are defined exactly as your questioner has uh, suggested based on the biophysical uh, limits. So, of course, it's a very difficult thing to assess in absolute terms, and that's why we tend now to create markets in terms of shares rather than in volume terms. Uh, but uh, if you don't respect the limits, well, then of course the whole system would collapse. Markets cannot override nature in that sense. Thank you. Um, I have another question for, um, uh, for, for you, Frank. Um, in the case of agricultural water use, do prices account for the virtual water outflows which arise from exporting agricultural pro produce? Do these outflows cause an externality? Uh, I think the answer is they could create externalities. But remember that if you have proper water pricing, then the value of the water becomes embedded in the cost of production of, say, almonds or any other good. And that cost becomes, of course, then something that consumers in the countries that buy these products bear. And uh, this is the main reason, I would say, that in Israel now, for example, the water use per uh, dollar of agricultural output is dramatically lower than elsewhere precisely because they've created markets, those prices become reflected in the cost of goods, and everybody has a very, very strong and persistent incentive to reduce the use of uh, water and therefore to reduce those costs. So you're right, if, if you don't have markets, if you don't have scarcity reflected in prices, then of course you are exporting you know, huge amounts of water to other jurisdictions, which you could use much more efficiently in your own country. So it's a real, a very good question, a very good point, but there is a solution. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I have a question myself um, related to this um, uh, role of market in water management. And what kinds of information needs to be collected to monitor market? Uh, Frank, do you want to answer to that? Uh, I can, but I think Matt is probably better suited to answer it, okay? Okay. Great. Uh, take a first crack at that one. And I think it's a really important question. We talk about the sort of wonder of markets and the efficiency with which markets can allocate goods. Um, but of course, understanding 
uh, that a market is well functioning really requires a, a fair amount of data. Um, and in particular, uh, in places where the resource that we're talking about is common pool, as Eleanor Ostrom described it, which means that anybody can you know, reach down and grab some, it's important to monitor exactly who's doing that, right? Because if there's open access to the resource and we aren't monitoring uh, who's taking it, then that market's going to collapse because there's no law governing who takes it and at what price. Um, so just to summarize all of that quickly, it's important to have baseline data uh, and monitoring about who's using it. Obviously, that's important not just for water, but many other common pool resources um, and greenhouse gases in particular. Uh, we also want transparency about price and who's transacting um, so that we can verify that uh, there isn't a situation in which a particular individual can exercise market power, uh, which means monopolizing or significantly controlling a share of the resources and limiting their availability in order to extract value from others. Um, and then obviously we want to make sure that the allocation that the market is providing is an efficient one. Uh, so monitoring how water is used um, and uh, the environmental outcomes associated with it, in particular for surface and groundwater, uh, are important factors. So baseline monitoring, monitoring environmental quality, monitoring ownership, and monitoring extraction are all critical. Thank you very much for this uh, answer. Um, we have the very last question. Um, this is, according to you, what are the main problems in improving the use of wa wastewater in agriculture? Who wants to answer? Matthew, you want to answer? Yeah. I repeat. What are the main problems in improving the use of wastewater in agriculture? Hmm. That's, an, that's an interesting question. Uh, again, the prices are wrong, I think, is one of the main problems. So the first line of defense against waste is to use water most efficiently the first time around. Uh, and so a good example of that, and I'm... I'm taking this to be agricultural wastewater as opposed to wastewater from other uses. But um, improving the efficiency with which water is applied uh, to, to biomass is probably the first best thing to do. And so there, having farmers face the true opportunity cost of using that water is going to get them uh, to improve the efficiency with which they use it. Obviously, then one of the challenges uh, with our current system is that because of, say, use of fertilizers, uh, the water that runs off back into streams um, can often be highly polluted. Uh, so managing fertilizer application is, is probably also a critically important aspect of uh, reducing the cost of using wastewater, uh, both for agricultural purposes and, and for others as well. Frank, d did you want to add to that? Um, I mean, a key issue really is also information. So price is 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 really important. But we're doing interesting work and with farmers in the U.S. in the Mississippi basin. And the evidence we have seems to show that farmers use more fertilizer than is financially efficient for them. And uh, we've had some success in uh, essentially conveying this evidence to farmers. And uh, some of them, at least, find that it just makes sense just from the pure financial management of it to reduce their fertilizer use, and that reduces the runoff into uh, downstream uh, areas and into the ocean, ultimately. Uh, another policy dimension that we're uh, looking at is using the supply chain uh, pressure to encourage farmers to reduce their waste into water systems. 
And the essence of that is that uh, supermarkets and big retailers are interested now in selling products to consumers that they can say is environmentally positive. And part of that is its climate change impact and part of it is its environmental impact more generally. And uh, they're basically saying to their suppliers, if you meet these certain standards, we will prioritize the purchase of your products and we will give them particular profile in our marketing and in our selling and so on. Um, so it's a very, very good question. Pricing is the fundamental thing that we need to get right, but there are many other policies that can complement and support that. Thank you very much. And uh, now I, I think we, yes, we have answered to almost all, all of the questions. So sorry for those who were not addressed. Um, so thank you very much to the speakers of today for this excellent presentation and, uh, and Q&A time. And thank you to all the auditors for um, asking questions. And um, I'm happy to, uh, to say that the slides will be uh, available uh, on our website at uh, www.iccg.org and uh, at the events page, webinar events page. And uh, also that next webinar, the last of this um, water series, will be held on December 16th. Uh, and it will be uh, on the impact of climate change on alpine water resources. So um, thank you very much to everybody and see you on December 16th. Bye-bye. <laughs>